I'm not really sure if uh, talking at, uh, as a last presenter is going to be a privilege, but um, really uh, this morning Clive was doing his uh, rehearsal, was doing mine, I was trying to find something exciting for you. And now, unfortunately, because of time, uh, I have to cut this short, so it'll be for the next time. Um, in essence, uh, what I would like to, you to, um, to listen to is, instead of focusing a lot about risk and harms, let's have a look at the future, and let's look at the positive aspects of, of vaping, because there are unexplored avenues in front of us. And I would like to share my personal enthusiasm with you by summarizing five or six years of research that we've been doing in this particular area. And we started um, with blood pressure. Okay, blood pressure is, um, is a common problem for many, many people. So we thought, well, let's try to investigate blood pressure and see whether we can bring some allies into, our, into the vaping world, because this can be another way to address a medical problem. Uh, here you see the, uh, the, the change in systolic blood pressure after one year in a number of patients who've been enrolled in the ECLAT study, which was a randomized control trial uh, assessing the role of uh, electronic cigarettes uh, in different doses, let me use this medical term, different levels of nicotine. Um, but then we stratified the sample by just looking at the smoking phenotypes, in this case, failures dual users and quitters. And as you can see here, it's not surprising, these were normal subjects by inclusion, there were no differences. But there were not spikes either for the vapors, you agree? It was interesting in a post-hoc analy analysis to see that if at baseline, some of these people had some high normal systolic blood pressure, well, by substratifying the smoking phenotypes, so you could see some reversal of harm. So the message was clear. We can actually have an effect by using electronic cigarette on blood pressure and cardiovascular risk factors. Uh, so it was very important for us to keep on going on this pathway and try to address the same question to people with pre-existing cardiovascular disease, people with hypertension. Uh, we knew then that electronic cigarettes were uh, effective and safe, effective in terms of smoking cessation, given the limitation of the early generation cigar likes. Uh, the smoking abstinence by using electronic cigarettes may lower the systolic blood pressure in healthy people with uh, higher, uh, higher baseline, blood pressure baselines. That we were very well aware at that time that no data was available in uh, hypertensive patients. So we, were, uh, we staged um, a retrospective study and collected data from clinics that were suggested to use uh, specialized uh, medical charts where together with uh, the smoking habits, there was a vaping habits uh, uh, for collection of data. And um, not surprisingly, vaping was effective in terms of reducing tobacco cigarette consumption, as you can see on this slide. But most importantly, there were significant, clinically significant changes in the systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure to the level of commonly used antihypertensives. This is not good news for drug industry, to be honest. And uh, on top of that, when you look at something slightly different, such as blood pressure control, 
which we can dichotomize as good control and poor control. I don't have time to explain in details the concept, but good control is you, your doctor saying, okay, you're doing just fine with your medication and go, go ahead with this. You will see here, uh, I really need to step down for a second and shout, okay, that here, the good control was very low at the baseline when nobody was using electronic cigarette. After sh switching, it was increasing, okay? Whereas people in the control group, the control group was not using any electronic cigarettes, they stayed at the same level. And this was a specialized cardiology clinic. By my exercise, good. <laughs> David will be happy, although he's, he, although he's a, he's more a biker than a, <laughs> all right. Um, it was intriguing also to see that the survey data uh, actually confirms our, um, our clinical studies. So this is a very well known studies by Costantinos in more than 29,000 vapors and specifically he asked the question to those with uh, uh, doc doctor, diagnose, diagnosis, uh, doctor diagnosis of hypertension and where 2,000, well over 2,000, where their blood pressure improved. And you see, 50% said blood pressure improved since they were vapors. Okay, this is a take home message. I will leave it there for 10 seconds for you to read. So I will refresh for a second. Now, okay, fine. Time's over for this. Uh, I'll be very quick uh, on, on the next slides because uh, David uh, really wants me to hire a bike and go around in Warsaw to <laughs> this afternoon. Uh, in essence, these slides will tell you from the same study, ECLAT, randomized controlled trial, uh, using uh, smoking phenotypes, failures, dual users and quitters, that when you look at the spirometry outcomes, spirometry is a funny object that sits in my office where you blow in a tube and you measure um, the caliber of your airways, okay? And you will see absolutely no difference in between the three smoking phenotype subgroups, right? And this is expected once again because by definition, by default, these population were healthy smokers. So nobody had uh, um, uh, a doctor diagnosis of COPD, of asthma, or whatever. However, interestingly, when you look at a very sensitive uh, measure of the more peripheral airways, you will start seeing something very interesting. <laughs> And that's what I mean by interesting. Going from 80% to normal, normalization of small peripheral airways caliber by switching to vaping. Yes, I like this. <laughs> you remember this talk. <laughs> okay, not for the talk itself, for me just running up and down. How many of you vape in this room? Ah. So do you remember the first month of your vaping? Do you remember the change in respiratory symptoms when you first, first time you start breathing better, less cough? Well, it's there, so th I don't have to tell you. <laughs> you. Um, but that was in so-called healthy smokers. Now, I have a um, vested interest in, in uh, asthma research because I receive a lot of money from drug companies. <laughs> uh, they're interested in that. Um, and um, yeah, once again, there was no data about uh, uh, pre-existing disease and we were interested in, in asthma. And uh, since then, the drug companies weren't interested in us. <laughs> Um, actually, this is a second follow-up study. Uh, in essence, I'll show you just one um, spirometric outcome, which is 
just to let you know, this funny name, FIV1, for the non-doctors, uh, uh, non-respiratory physician, is a, a very hard outcome. It's very important. When it changes, it means that the drug is doing something. It means that your physiotherapy is doing something. And it changes with regular electronic cigarette use by 100 ml. It seems a, a little, uh, 100 ml, uh, less than half a Coke can, but it's a lot. It actually compares very well with bronchodilation. And this is an assessment up to two years. I know that two years may not be enough to prove the long-term efficacy of uh, uh, vaping, uh, but I cannot wait 10 years, guys. I'll be too, too old for that. So let's stick to the two years time point. Okay, these are the other um, um, outcomes from spirometry, and they are all constant and going into the same direction. This is quality of life, which is improving because it goes down. You know, spirometry improvement goes up, and quality of life go goes down. So because the score, it, it's uh, much smaller. How much time do you have, uh, David? A couple of minutes. Okay. I think this is concept about asthma exacerbation is very important because one of the most important thing in asthma is not spirometry. It's quality of life and number of exacerbation. How many asthma attacks do you have in a month? Okay. Um, this was a population of mild, moderate patients, so you don't have many asthma attacks, not even in a year one or two asthma attacks in a year. So the baseline is very narrow. So we weren't able to show any changes there. However, two patients in the last segment of the study drop out because they couldn't find the, the vape shops because they closed. They returned to smoke and they had a more exacerbation. It's anecdotal because it's only two patients, but it's uh, worth keeping in mind and worth keeping in line with this new data on COPD patients, which mirrors what's happening in asthma. Improvement in quality of life and improvement in redu and reduction in severe exacerbation. COPD patients, this is very relevant, smoke-related disease. And it's also in tune and in line with the Farsalinus survey. You see 65.4 improvement in asthma when you switch, and 75, a staggering 75.70% in COPD. Of course, these are self-selected populations, but it's important. Another take-home message for you, two minutes, uh, no two seconds because I have two minutes, so I have to dictate the agenda from here. <laughs> you got the microphone. <laughs> I got the microphone, you don't? Okay. But in essence, it's an helpful alternative, even in smokers with, uh, with asthma and COPD, in my opinion, you know? And we, I don't think we'll have. The areas of ex medical exploration is immense. Is, uh, universe. Just try to think of those areas where nicotine can be advantageous and where scientists and researchers like me dare to enter because when you start doing something with nicotine, you'll be demonized for studying nicotine. But in fact, there's a lot of room for scientific uh, involvement because of Parkinson, ulcerative colitis, um, major depression, schizophrenia, attention deficit disorders, and mild com cognitive impairments, and so forth. So if we look at this through my um, medical lenses, uh, it is pretty much obvious that one of the problems with the drugs is that we are not engineered to take pills, tablets, or to have injections. We're not engineered for that. We are forced to that when we become ill. Uh, with vaping, is a different story. As the previous presenter said, just said, it's fun. Why not converting this fun into the medical profession? That's the idea, very simple. And, and that can be applied in a whole spectrum of uh, 
of uh, activities in the medical profession. For example, we can replace syringes for vaccination and for, for insulin injection. We can use cannabinoids, which is the active principle from marijuana for uh, ref pain control of refractory pain, which is a pain, okay? And then, most importantly, improved medication adherence, which is a pain in the neck also for the drug industry. So if we can leverage this idea that vaping may help adherence, we'll have an extra lie that at the moment is fighting against us. Us, you, I don't vape, I'm sorry. Another areas of, ex uh, of exploration, and of course I don't have time to delve into this into details, is the hedonistic area and the wellness area. How many of you would like to, to lose a little bit of weight? Don't be shy now, huh? Too, too little, I cannot believe this, you're a liar. <laughs> when it comes to vaping, if it was an obesity conference, maybe there was a different outcome, uh, this question, right? Anyway, same study, um, so I don't have to repeat the same story again, but in essence, if you look at the clo uh, open squares, as expected, when you quit smoking, you put up some weight, even if you vape. The point is that you really need to, and I'll use my last two minutes by <laughs> jogging, just place attention at the scale of the y-axis. 4% of your baseline body weight is what you put during Christmas holiday. It's normal. It's a yo-yo effect, so it's very little. I, we then uh, decided, okay, let's take this into the context of other smoking cessation trials. And see, that's what, what happens. When you quit smoking with buparopion, with varenicline, with NRT, you put up quite a lot of weight. Not with vaping. Vaping is more, uh, well, it comes out nicely from this comparison. So the idea is to use vaping to control body weight. Isn't that a great idea? Right. It's not my idea. I, I just checked the internet and there are already people working on these avenues, vapor diet for their weight loss program. I don't really know what they put inside, so don't ask me. But they can improve sleep, anxiety, can be used as an energy boost, memory boost. But vaping is all about emotion, sensation, uh, not cognition. You know, of course, you need to be informed of what you're taking. It's, it's, it's part of the business. But it's more about an emotional thing. So I really would like to inspire you to support more research programs addressing consumer hedonic and sensory characteristics. Uh, and I'm very sorry that I don't have time to talk about more about this because this is a very fantastic world unveiling. So. The future is minimize risk and maximize benefits at all spectrum. And only if we minimize risk and benefit, benefit and maximize benefit and minimize risks, we will be able to help regulators to be convinced that this is the good pathway and will be able to sustain what David Nutt said a couple of years ago that e-cigarettes are the greatest health advance since vaccinations. Thank you. <laughs>